Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm Chris Lee. Our guest today, Seabass of WNWS of Jackson, Tennessee. We don't have a title sponsor at the moment. If you're interested in sponsoring this podcast, email me at chrislee70 at gmail.com. Our news is presented by Sutherland and Belk, a Nashville-based injury law firm. Sutherland and Belk is committed to fighting for those who've been injured in car, motorcycle, and truck accidents. Check them out at sbinjurylaw.com. Well, the SEC has moved closer to a 10-game SEC-only schedule, according to Sports Illustrated's Ross Dellinger. Dellinger believes Vanderbilt would pick up Alabama and Mississippi State as additional opponents this year, in addition to the eight it already has within the Southeastern Conference. Our guest line is presented by Bolin Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates. Scott and Missy Tannen, I had no clue how comfortable sheets could be until I got Bolin Branch sheets. They are fair trade certified, meaning they are made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them free for a month. You can return them, but you won't want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to BowlinBranch.com. That's spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Seabass joins us from WNWS in Jackson, Tennessee, as he does most weeks. Thanks for joining us, my friend. What's happening, Super Freak? Oh, what a week. Oh, good. Well, who you telling, man? <laughs> who in the world are you telling? I'm telling you, man, it's it's, it's flying on by. Isn't it weird? Do you realize that tomorrow's August? I know. I'm supposed to be all hyped up and going crazy and counting the days. I hadn't counted a day, and I couldn't tell you when. I don't know if they're going to have a football season to be honest with you I know that schedules or the planned schedules or whatever you want to call it the fact that they're going to have 10 games and SEC only been released but the undercurrents I'm hearing indicate to me they're going to have some difficulty pulling this off not to mention what's happening happening in Major League Baseball well I mean, I know that the Cardinals had a couple of uh, test positives a day and they canceled their game. And and I get it with the Marlins, but uh, I don't know. Look, the the bubble side of the things, the, the bubble seems to be working, Chris. I mean, it's worked for the NHL and it's worked for, for the NBA. What did they have the other day? Zero new tests? You know, I... I don't know how feasible it is for everybody and and on the college level uh, or if that's even possible football wise, but uh, you know, and you know, with, with baseball, I mean, earlier in the week you had what uh, one Marlin test positive after that, that initial outbreak and nobody else on any other team. Now we've got a couple of St. Louis Cardinals and, and some scatter smatterings here and there, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's worked out so far, you know, now, I mean, this time next week, maybe having a completely different conversation, but the truth is, who are those people that you're talking to? They have no idea. They got no idea what's coming. You know, I mean, it, it, everything that you or me or any of those people, I don't care what kind of expert they are. It is pure speculation at this point. The one thing that is not speculation is that so far the bubble approach does seem to work. I'm not disputing any of that. I think that they have found some things with the bubble that have worked. I watched a little bit of NBA last night. I don't normally watch that, but we had some company over, and they wanted to watch that. And I do think they've done a good job. I think the issues for college football are going to be different. I think you've got this name, likeness, and image stuff that has really started to highlight the discrepancy between players' economic value And what they get, I think you've had the stuff with the college basketball scandal that we've talked ad nauseum. I think the issue is going to be, because like you said, nobody knows, right? And I'm not taking a side on this necessarily, but I think you're going to have, I don't know, I think that they're going to have a problem 
in terms of the things that I'm hearing in terms of maybe guaranteeing kids, I don't know how to put it, safety, those sorts of things, safeguards, um, protection for consequences, that kind of stuff. I think what I'm trying to say is I think the players are starting to figure out they've got the power. I'm not sure that the NCAA has had great answers in terms of eliminating concerns. And I think next week could get very interesting. Yeah, and it certainly could. Now the question is the approach from the players. Let's just say you say they're recognizing these things, and that, and that may be the case. It, but what does it mean to recognize it in Nashville as versus recognizing that in Tuscaloosa? Well, that's a great question, um, and we could probably spend an hour alone on that one, but I think once something becomes a movement, it gets momentum, and that's what I'm keeping my eye on. Yeah, you know, it's just that I've had I've, I've I've had so much of that for the last couple of months. I mean, I've I've heard that in every single direction. I'm just ready for a resolution on it. You know, at, by this point, I mean, I the, the, just to say that the possibility does that exist? You know, of some interruption or who knows? Yeah, everybody knows that. We 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 know that's a possibility. We've known that already, and look, we're hoping, and are we hoping against hope? I don't know, but we know that's a possibility. We've known that for months, you know. You know, we hoped that this would be gone away uh, and that would, wouldn't be an issue by the time we got here, but it hasn't. So now we go with the hand that's dealt. I mean, we're already seeing schedule adjustments. I don't know. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the future holds. I'm not sure what's next. Uh, I'm just, you know. Uh, the thought of not having a college football season, Chris, I mean, as bad as this year has been already, uh, and the fact we already didn't get to have an NCAA tournament and didn't get to have a, a, a college baseball season, uh, just the thought of not having college football is just the icing on a turd Sunday, you know, you know the, the cherry on top of a turd Sunday. Yeah, I mean, it's been that kind of a year. You know, you know, but God, I mean, it's just, I don't want to have another depressing podcast. I don't. There's got to be some kind of good news. Well, I'd love to see football. Trust me, um, I really would. Yeah. Uh, we need something. It's been a we need it. That's what I think. That's what we don't want it anymore. We need it. We need it at this point. But it's not their job to play if they're, if they're not safe because we need it. And I understand that, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be optimal and it's got to be safe for these guys to do that. And I want that first and foremost. And if it's not, then, then, then they don't need to do it. But, you know, I'm just so sick of hearing these talking heads telling us, Hey, you may not have college. Yeah, we know, we know. Uh, But I mean, I'm, I've I've decided myself that I'm not going to sit one way or the other on it because there's no way I have any idea on July the 1st what's going to happen come September. We know it's been pushed back. When's the start been pushed back to, Chris? Like the last week in September, I think it is? It is, yes. The 26th is supposed to be opening day for the SEC. And so help me understand this. Uh, All non-conference games are gone is that right sounds that way and there would be nothing but a 10 game sec schedule now well well hold on unless depends on what they do with what the acc did because the acc sort of stuck it in the sec's face i heard it didn't go over too well what the acc did with leaving that one game open with the sec rivalry weekend i don't think the sec from what i'm told knew that was coming so that is the one thing that I guess nothing is final until we get the official word, but that is the one other thing. I don't know what the league will do with that. I saw someone post the other day, but I haven't seen a version of what Vanderbilt's schedule would look like conference-wise. People were mentioning us playing Mississippi State and Alabama. Is that something that's already been set in stone, or was that just speculation? That was what Ross Dellinger had reported. I don't think that's been made official yet. 
please don't make us play Alabama. <laughs> I just, I, I still feel it from the last time. What was it, Chris? Fifty nine to nothing, and that's after they took the foot off the gas. Yeah, that was the infamous Alabama. Your next game. Oh man, man, that was that was one of the worst physical beatings I've ever seen uh, any football team take. I, you know. I'm calling calf rope right now. And especially when we have a lot of question marks on offensive line and a guaranteed first time starting quarterback one way or the other. Yeah. I don't really want to play Alabama. I don't know about you. I have loved having baseball back. Oh, if well, you know, I have tell you the truth. If it wasn't for two crazy blown plays, blown save plays, my boys would be seven and zero right now instead of five and two. But I'll take five and two all day long. I'm to the point. I don't care who I'm watching. It's just good to have something to watch. It's good to sit in front of the TV at night and spend time with my kid, and not have to think mm-hmm. about what is going on with everything else. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, now for me, my approach when it comes to Major League Baseball, I do love it, but. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm centrally focused on the Padres. You know, I watch, I come home. It's a beautiful thing, Chris, to have the extra innings package because I get off work. Um, my show ends at eight o'clock at night. I get home about eight 30 and they, you first pitch on the West coast is usually a nine Oh five pitch, eight 45, nine Oh five. So it's, 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 it's been, it's been great, man. I just, I've took it all in, man. And to be real honest with you, Chris, because I'm not getting into all the political side of things. I just refuse to do it. I'll let people way more brilliant than me let, let everybody know how brilliant they are. Um, I'm here for the sports, so I can sit back and I can just watch a baseball game, and that's all I see, Chris. I don't have to listen to all the craziness going on in my life or in this world and in this country. I can just sit back and watch a baseball game. And I'm going to tell you something. People keep focusing in on the cardboard cutouts. That's generally sports talk show hosts who either don't know what they're talking about or don't really have anything to say. So they focus on crap like that. Let me tell you something. It, that's such a non-issue. You know, I'm, the, I'm, the ambient noise is there. And, you know, once they get the thing going and rolling, to me, I'm just watching a regular baseball game by that point. I don't focus on what's written in the dirt and behind the, on the back of the mound. I don't do any of that. It's weird. I just sit back and watch baseball. I am right there with you, and I think I've been as locked in on the baseball as I've ever been. The cardboard cutouts to me at first, I thought that was sort of silly. That's kind of grown on me. Because you're seeing what some teams have done with that. Like, I think the A's have put, you look in the stands, and there's Jose Canseco, and there's Mark McGuire, and there's Connie Mack and Eddie Collins. And some teams have really gotten creative with that. I think Chipper Jones, didn't he buy a bunch of cutouts of himself to put in Shea Stadium? Which, the joke there, if people followed that, Chipper Jones used to just wear the Mets out in New York to the point where he named his first burnt firstborn Shea after Shea Stadium. So there is some <laughs> stuff in there that I find very amusing if you're really paying attention. But I'm I'm more there for the yeah. baseball like you, but like even the sideshow element of it is kind of entertaining at times. Well, and people will say things like, you know, because I've had a few callers, but it's generally the ones that don't really watch anyway. Uh, but I've had a few of them say, well, you know, it's just, there's nobody there and the cardboard cutouts. And I said, well, okay, let's think about this for a second. And on a general baseball broadcast, the truth of the matter is outside of, uh, you know, a foul, sharply hit foul ball into the stands or uh, depending on the camera angle, uh, for the most part during almost basically every pitch, what do you see? Three, four rows behind home plate. You know? Yeah. And the rest of the action, the, the, the rest of the action is contained on the field. So, I mean, and you add in the ambient crowd noise and the fact that we've been itching for real life sports anyway. And, man, I'm, I'm good, man. I, I'm fine. I mean, let me just say this. The sports that I have seen so far uh, with things like UFC fights, I prefer it without the crowds. Uh, do I prefer this version of baseball over a crowd? No, of course not. But I don't notice this drastic. It's not just this completely – different game. It's still baseball. Uh, now I will say this. I'm currently watching the Grizzlies as we're doing this podcast. And this looks more like a pickup game at a community center. It is, it's, 
it's different. You know, now admittedly I have the sound down, but this is not a good looking product, at least so far. You know, and I have to give it more of a day in court, but my initial reaction is of the sports that I have seen uh, played, you know, have restarted so far. The one that I've had the biggest issue with so far to me is NBA basketball. The NHL launches this weekend, I believe. Go Flyers. And they'll go straight into the playoffs. So I'm going to be glued to that, at least to the Predators end of things. Yeah, well, I mean, and once they get bounced, you can stick with my flyers till we hoist up the cup. Don't do me like that. Come on. Don't do you like that. It's our turn, man. It's our time. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. What if it's, it's our for turn? Me to get a little judgment. Uh, last time I remember, y- y'all were the ones that had hundreds of thousands of people back in the street. Was a knife to a hot knife to butter. Uh, I haven't had anything to pull for, but I do now. So, and we finally got us a goalie. So, you know, love y'all. If we can't win, it's nice to be y'all, but it's our turn. Shall we just go into the mailbag at this point? Hey, man, you know, uh, you know, now, uh, no, not yet. Just one or two things. Uh, what are we thinking? I mean, I, look, I know the confidence level is still higher there, and I feel good about it, but I really, 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 really want to get Gabe Dorsey. You know, I, I think he is exactly – what Coach Stackhouse needs. This is one of the best long-range shooters uh, in the entire country and I think would be an extremely solid addition uh, to Coach Stack's uh, team. Uh, I know he's supposed to be announcing Sunday. I mean, everything seems to point to Nashville, but nothing's done until it's done. Well, my man David Sisk is optimistic about it, so I always take my cues from him on that. David, if he knows... If he has an opinion, he has an opinion for a reason. So if David thinks it's going to happen, that's where I'm going to go. You know, and I mean, look, that's that's one thing we need. We need people who can fill it up. You know, this is a very different type of basketball these days. And so it's all about it's all about these perimeter shooters. And, you know, we're not blessed with a ton of them. You know, so he would be a major get. I don't think there's any question about that. But, uh, you know, I mean, I look, you know, it looks like Stack is starting to pick it up a little bit on that end, man. And I like that. I mean, that's, you know, it's certainly something to look forward to. Hopefully they can get him. And then, oh, Chris, you'll have to help me. What's the young man's name? DeMarco Dunn. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. That I mean, that would be. That'd be a great little one, too. I know they missed that on John Butler, and I know a lot of folks were hoping to, and that'd have been nice. And, you know, maybe a little late in the game, but uh, it, it, I think he went to Florida State, I think it was, earlier in the week. But, you know, I, I, I'm glad to see, you know, some, some bigger names giving uh, Stackhouse a little bit more attention uh, as he looks to fill that roster out. Are we ready for the mailbag now? Uh, yeah. The mailbag is sponsored by Vanderbilt fan Josh Minton, an independent insurance agent operating out of Brentwood who can take care of all your insurance needs. Call him today, 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Twitter at joshuamintonhq or facebook.com forward slash shadymintonhq. He's my insurance agent. Give him a try. Tell him you heard about it here. Buff Door says... If you were made the AD and can unveil a strategic plan to the key stakeholders at VU and or the public, what would be the five, six top things you'd like to accomplish over the next five, ten years? How would you prioritize those items? Who would you involve in formulating and the executing of the plan? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, where do you start, Chris? Uh, holy smokes. Uh, you know, I, I guess one of the main things that I would do, you know, this is if I am, because if I am running things, then I know what one of our major focuses is going to be. Uh, and that's going to be a return. I say a return, uh, but a, an emphasis on athletics and, and not and not being treated as some type of, you know, some type of thing that we just simply have to do to make sure we get that big fat check. Um 
But man, you know, one of the, one of the main things I'm going to do is I'm going to stress to my, uh, you know, to my employees and to my alumni and to my, uh, and to my, and to those former players and to my fan base that we have a, I guess you could say renewed uh, enthusiasm about athletics, but uh, however you want to phrase that, uh, and that they are going to be an integral part of everything going forward. We're going to be transparent. We're going to tell you, we're going to give you timelines. We're not going going to say something and then, you know, just wait. The time is coming. The time is coming. Every time it gets addressed, uh, it's not now, but the time is coming. I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to answer questions. Now, logistic wise, I don't know a thing in the world about being an athletic director or, or being in charge of stuff like that. So I don't know how you do that. But one thing I, like I said, is I'm going to make sure everybody knows and I'm going to scream it the way Franklin did on the radio waves when he came to town. You're going to know that we are absolutely drop dead serious about competing in athletics at the highest level. And then we're not just about picking up a free paycheck, you know, yeah. Then I'm going to make sure that these boosters, uh, uh, know where they stand them and they're going to know exactly. And then never, I'm never going to let them be in a situation where my athletes, my SEC athletes are in a weight room that doesn't have air conditioning in the summertime. That will never happen. If I have to go out there and learn how to fix it myself, I'm going to be out there doing that. These types of things. I'm going to make sure that these parents know that their kids are in great hands, that not only are they going to get that world-class education that we talked about, but we're going to treat them like the true, uh, what's the word for, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not commodities. That's not what I'm trying to say. The uh, we have an invest. We have an investment in them. They've invested in us, and we're going to make sure that those families know uh, that those kids are going to be well taken care of. You know uh, that, that that they'll be free to speak their mind, and they'll get the best of everything that we can possibly provide for them. And that's you know I know that you know that sounds like a lot of wonderful talk and how do you go about implementing i don't know i'm not in that business but those are some of the things that i guarantee i'd at least attempt to do right off the bat what about you you know i think this would be a good start they did a lot of the research on those things from what i understand it depends on who you talk to as to what people think about what malcolm turner did and i'm not Honest to God, I don't know the entire truth, but what I'm told is I think Malcolm had some stuff, and in fact, I meant to find this out before the podcast today. What I was told was that the strategic plan that Candace came out with, well, obviously we know that was tailored towards Kirkland, right? Because no fan looked at that and said, hey, that's really something. But I think that there was a facilities part of that that was gutted when it was announced. So I would go back... Because Malcolm and those guys spent money on consultants and did research. There's got to be a body of work of stuff they found. As everybody knows, there was an $800 million price tag on things that they needed to do. My understanding is that was pretty loosely stated. Um, you know, I think that was more towards maybe the high end. It was certainly getting it up to SEC standards, but it was at least a target, right? And Let's say you aim at eight hundred million dollars, but you only come in at four hundred million. Well, it's still miles better than what you had, right? So I think right. you could go back. There was some research done on those things to some degree. You could at least go back to that and use that as your pickup from here point. See what else needs to be addressed. But I think that would be a good start. I think that's a good start as well. What else you got? Oh, let's see. Did we answer all that? Well, accomplishments. I mean, obviously, to me, you renovate the football stadium. You put in the football building. You do some stuff to Memorial Gym. You do some things that help you in recruiting. You get priority registration for athletes. You make sure that McGugan has got its hands out of fundraising or Kirkland has its hands out of fundraising. I mean, when you start about talking about what to do, that's a start. Who would you involve in formulating and executing the plan? I mean, the two guys I always say that should be involved in a lot of athletic decisions over there are Tim Thompson and Tim Corbin because they know a lot of people and have seen a lot of things. I don't think they ever are involved in anything. But those are just some off-the-top-of-my-head answers. Those would be some really good starting points that I don't think that you could go wrong with. I agree, and I think both of those two cats would be very, very uh... – 
they, they would be huge pieces and people that we should be leaning on. And those guys, I mean, those are people that are all VU, you know I mean? That's, you know, that's what, that's, they're all in and we need to be all in for them and with them and have, and, and have them in, in regards to everything that is athletics plan wise. I mean, I, you know, as long as they're willing and I'm sure they would be, uh, I, I don't know why they wouldn't be the first people you address. This one from Bear 8000, why do you think the football team has almost disappeared, or really, excuse me, the fan base has almost disappeared the last couple of years? What's different now compared to the 80s, 90s, and 2000s when we were also losing but still had a fan base? You know, I, I, I think now, you, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, uh, but I think... I, I think it was the best and maybe possibly the worst thing ever uh, for Vanderbilt football was James Franklin. You know, because it, it, I mean, look, yeah, we you know, in the early eighties, but think about this. Think about this. When Bobby Johnson went to the bowl game, uh, when he went to that music city, what Chris Duff. And in the history of that program, through all that time, it was the fourth time they'd ever even been to a ball game. Think about that for a second, man. And at that time, they'd only had one bowl win in the history of their program. One bowl win. I can't even get my mind around that. And, you know, then Franklin comes in and shows you all these preconceived notions that you had about this program. You, you put your own governor on it. You know, you, 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 the limitations that you set are set by you. You know, it's not geographic. It's not that you're a private school. It's not anything else. You 100% can win here. He won nine games in a row, two years in a row, and never had a losing regular season. Never had one. Never even had one. And all of a sudden, and then think about what it looked like when we went to bowl games. We traveled pretty well, didn't we, Chris? And what does that tell you? There are people that if you would just invest in this program, there are people that are dying for that. A lot of them. I was there in Memphis. I was there in Nashville. I wasn't able to get to the game in Birmingham. Uh, but But I was there, and I saw hordes of fans like I'd never seen before. And... There they were. So it told me, you know, all this time it was all about, you know, putting your best foot forward. And for a couple of years, we were able to do that. You know, now, here's what I will say. Uh, Derek Mason's had some good moments. Not a ton of them, but he's had a few good moments. He's recruited rather decently. And, you know, he's been to a bowl game. And the team that, you know, fell just short against a good Baylor team was a pretty good football team. You know, the inconsistencies are there, and last year was what it was. It was an absolute unmitigated unmitigated disaster. But, you know, then I start going back to, you could say what you want about Derek, but who's what great college or even really good coaches are out there that consistently play in a Power 5 conference that get zero help actually uh, get, get detracted from their administration? Who, who wins that way? No one does. You know, but for a brief moment in time, we weren't sitting back straddled with, uh, you know, and th- think about this. Think about this. Now it's, it's, it's been, light has been shed by local media, not just you. Yeah, yes, you for sure. Uh, but the Joes and the Adams of the world who have sh- shown a light on just how uh, dire things are inside that department, you know, and we have we got a chance to see how the how the the donuts were made, and I don't like the way they're made, you know. A, a, at this point, so I don't know that you can go back, you know. But we've been exposed to what it's like to to play winning football, to give a damn about what happens on Saturday nights, you know, in Nashville, Tennessee. Those things happened. We don't have them right now, you know. And 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 I think it's really worn on people. And you know, the the truth of the matter is, think about this. Here's something else, Chris, and this may be an even bigger deal uh, for Nashville and the people in West, in the Middle Tennessee, in the Nashville area. In the '80s, what they have besides that? Nothing. Not really. But now, man, hey, 
forget you. I'll spend my money on the Titans. I'll spend my money on the Predators. You know, I'll spend my money on soccer. I may be spending my money on Major League Baseball before it's said and done. I don't have to have you anymore uh, for my inter- for my sports entertainment dollar. I've got multiple solid options that weren't there in the 80s. I think the other factor is coaching. And look, Derek Mason's record on the whole hasn't been a lot worse than most coaches, right? I mean, they're all about the same, but – At some point, the fan base gets fed up with the coach and they're ready to move on. And just bringing somebody else in, you usually get about a two-year honeymoon for the most part. So I think just having a different person in that chair uh, would do a world of difference. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll ride with that. But think about this for a second. Now, you could make an argument that the best horse jockey in the world right now is Irad Ortiz. You can make that argument. I would make now, that argument. Put, I, do you know who Irad Ortiz is? I have no idea. <laughs> I was just I think egging you along here. No, he, he's one of the most successful jockeys there is right now. He and his brother, Jose, they're amazing. Um, you put him on a 85 to one plug and you stick him in a stakes race with grade one winners, you know, who are coming from Baffert barns and, you know, things like that, you know, Chad Brown trainer, and you stick him on some 80 to one plug from a Muni track and stick him in that race. You shouldn't expect him to cross the finish line first. Doesn't matter that he's an outstanding jockey. If you put him on a horse with no chance, if you don't give them everything they need to succeed, yeah, he could screw around and some crazy things could happen and they might win one every now and then. But the truth is he's outclassed. Who could come in here with no help from the administration whatsoever? Uh, as a matter of fact, they do the opposite of it and win football and win at football in this conference. Because I, cause I'll wait. You know, we could talk about what, Derek Mason is or he isn't, but I'm t- I submit to you right now that I don't know what he is because I've never seen what would happen if he was saddled with an opportunity. If he had a university that stuck behind him and said, I'm going to give you the best of everything that you can possibly have to try to succeed against the biggest and the best that this co- that college football landscape has to offer. But he doesn't have that. You know, forget about the fact that he's got to play the Alabama's Florida's worlds uh he's got to battle his own administration so i mean we can sit here and talk about yeah well it's the coaching and if we just had somebody else in here are you sure about that are you sure about that because i'm not i'm going to give you what's going to sound like contradictory answers i don't think he has the overall qualifications to be head coach. He's just not organized enough, and I don't think that he puts in the attention to detail and work that he needs to be a successful head coach. That said, he has been to two bowls. He has beaten Tennessee three times in a row. I don't think his processes a lot of times are very good, but he has occasionally gotten results with that, okay? Um, Okay. So I don't think he's a long-term answer, but I will say this. I think right now – a coaching change may be the last thing they need because you got those people that are making bad decisions right now who are going to be in charge of making the next hire. And I'll tell you what, I did not think Candace Lee was qualified for that job when she got it. I will also tell you this, I am shocked to the degree at which she's underqualified. I did not think she was the right person for the job. I also did not think she would be as bad as she has been. I think she's got skin thin as tissue paper. I don't think that she can, frankly, hold up to the rigors of the job and the pressure that's going to come with it. And God help her if they have a football season and go 0-10. Because the emails are going to come. I don't think the school is going to want to spend the money to get rid of Mason. Um, I who think, are they coming from? Who are they well, coming from? Well, who are those emails coming from? Well, there, there's still some people left. I mean, you can check Twitter, but point is, if they 
have a disaster of a football season. Again, I'm not convinced it's going to happen. The emails and the calls for her head are going to come, and she's either going to have to deal with it and take the criticisms that comes with it, or she's going to have to fight her own administration on making a change. And then when she does, right, her track record for selecting and choosing coaches through the one crack that she has had at it was horrendous. I frankly do not think she is going to, and the school is going to, find the best coach available. I think it's going to consider other things first. That's my opinion, but it's also based on recent history. And is she going to have the guts, even if she got that far, to push for the right person and then to make the guarantees to somebody who would be a good candidate, like a Will Healy, Is she going to be able to sell them on the right stuff? I just don't see her as being the right person for that job. I think your better hope, and I think it's a slim hope, um, is that maybe there's changes within a year. I don't think it's going to happen. But I just don't think right now, if Derek Mason walked away, do you want the people running Vanderbilt to make the next hire? And keep in mind, that's probably a three- or four-year proposition at minimum. So if they don't get that one right, then what happens? The, the, the point is here is that you're, you, you, you be fishing in a pond that's got no fish in it. You know, and the, the pond hasn't even been stocked yet. I mean, think about this for a second. If they're, Because I remember I asked you a question. How many other people did Vanderbilt? Uh, uh, how many other people did Vanderbilt interview for the athletic department, athletic director job? Zero. Okay. Uh, how how many places has Candace Storley been an athletic director at before before Vanderbilt previously? How many other schools? Zero. So you hired somebody who's never been an athletic director, and you didn't interview not one other person for an SEC athletic director's job. There's not, that's, that's what I'm telling you, Chris, man, stop talking about coaches, man. You get that out. Take that, take that right out of your mouth. Cause it doesn't matter. That is all you need to know. There is nothing else. That's all you need to know. You took somebody who's never even had that job and you didn't interview one other person. When, by the way, didn't they say they were going to, they did that they, were, that they were gonna and they didn't interview a single other person as far as you know of. No, they didn't. And she the was there were it, that was coming from multiple places. Yeah. Then there's nothing to say. It's not about Derek Mason. It's not about Jerry Stack or Stephanie White or any of them. It's not about any of them. It's it's a right, it's about the people above their head. No school in there and that's not a knock on Candace. That's anybody. You're not doing your due diligence, no matter who you are, because you don't know. And as I've heard you mention, there are there were a multiple other potential players out there. When I say players, I'm talking about potential athletic directors at established Power Five schools who had made it known to the people that need that they were absolutely interested and they're just waiting to be contacted and never were. Now you explain that to me. Now, how in the Hades is that due diligence and doing your job? The answer is it's not. So I'm uninterested in hearing things about Derek Mason and what, why he's the problem at Vanderbilt football or, or, or Stephanie White or any of these other people, because they're not the problem. They're well, not the problem. The clock is also ticking on the chancellor. I mean, if he had wanted to say, okay, let's spend a a year or six months to evaluate Candace in the interim, I don't think that would have been the right decision, but it would have been a better decision. Instead, he went all in with her. That has been a disaster. I think it will continue to be a disaster because she does not have what it takes to be an AD. And by the way, I don't think the avalanche of bad publicity is done for her. Um, Number two... The media relations fiasco, that's on his watch too. So he's already started the clock on his own record with athletics, and it's been terrible so far. So I think it begs yeah. the question of if the president is involved in this, and of course his last stop was the University of Chicago, which is a non-factor in athletics. It's D3. I think you have to also question, okay, you've got the president in charge. He's got a big learning curve in front of him. If he wants to take sports seriously, he is nowhere near where he needs to be. And again, I think he's getting his stuff 
from the Kirkland Hall folks who don't have a clue what they're doing with athletics. So he is going to have to have some outside influence and some outside wisdom before he make before he makes any more decisions with athletics because the well, people around him are one thousand percent unfit to help him to do that. You're either a shot caller in this life or you're not. You either are or you're not. I don't care if you've been there for five minutes or 55 years. You're either a shot caller or you're not. And as you have mentioned so far, Jeremiah's shown me squat. You know, you're either a decision maker or you're not. I have nothing else to say about that. Vandy fan 96 says, what would you do to increase fandom and loyalty? I think they should do ticket deals with Nashville SC moving forward with one game yearly played in Nashville fairground stadium. Yo, man. I mean, any, any, uh, you know, every little bit helps, but man, this is Southeastern conference football. You know, it really shouldn't be this hard, Chris. You know what I'm saying? It just shouldn't be this difficult. It just shouldn't be this difficult. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I get that. I mean, a football stadium on Saturdays. I don't know that. You know, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I don't know if those two fan bases are, uh, if those two sports overlap. You know, if, if if they do or not, uh, at, at this point, you know, beggars can't be choosers and you take what you can get. Yeah. I mean, I, whatever it takes at this point, I hate gimmicks, you know, but we got to do something. But again, I mean, none of that matters if we're not fixing thing eternal internally. Remember that? Remember there was a hype video that was done during the Franklin era and they had, uh, Oh, what's his name? Les Brown. Les Brown, the motivational speaker. Uh, I don't know if you remember who that is, but Les Brown uh, quoted an old African proverb in that hype video. He said, if the enemy, if there is no enemy within, the outside enemy can do us no harm. Yo, Holmes, I, your enemy is not UT. And it's not their fan base, and it's not any of the other fan bases. The people, the things that are keeping this program, or these programs, and this university from an athletic standpoint, that are keeping them down, it's not about how good the other programs are. It's about how disinterested ours are. That's it. I believe that with everything I got, because what I do know is that I've seen when we had people in there who were interested in making this happen, there's nobody well, almost nobody that we can't hang with. So all this other outside stuff is, I mean, it, it kind of is what it is, but uh, if we want to turn all this stuff around, then we need to do some house cleaning of epic proportions. The problem is Seabass and Chris Lee can't do house cleaning. We, we don't have that type of pool. But we do have people that do have type of that pool, but they want to spend time blaming other people who are not at fault, you know, by any stretch of imagination. And we'll point it out that they're putting a spotlight on. It. Let me tell you something. Those people putting the spotlight on it are the actual people who are at least administering change or attempting to do so. They shouldn't be ridiculed for that. They should be applauded for that. Vanderbilt's problem is it has no idea how to take constructive criticism. And I think it is so insecure as an institution that I think all it knows how to do is shoot the messenger. I won't argue with that. I think there's a lot of truth to that. My short answer to that and question I, and is... I sit here and I listen to this. I sit here and listen to this and I think to myself, what in that... What has, what makes me a Vanderbilt fan? You know what I'm saying? What am I doing? Why why am I still after all this time? You know, forty seven years, and I'm still a fan, knowing how I know they're going to treat me. You know, knowing that what I think and how I express that doesn't mean thing in the world to them. It completely falls on deaf ears, and yet here I am, more way more worked up about it than they'll ever be. Pedor asks, who lasts the longest at Vanderbilt? Who's the first to go? One, Stephanie White. Two, Derek Mason. Three, Candace Lee. Oh. Uh, last one to go is, what was the, what was the question? Last one to go? 
Yes. Can I have their ages, please? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, man, that that's... <sighs> I don't even know how to answer this, Chris. I'm going to take my cue from you. I mean, I, I, they're not. I don't see any of them going anywhere anytime soon. Now, I will say this: I think the one who should go the least is Derek Mason. You know, and and if it sounds like I'm some type of Derek Mason apologist, I'm not. You know, I mean, there's plenty of things that I don't get. But there's also things that I like about Derek Mason. I mean, I've sh- I've seen signs. He's been to bowl games. He's won six games twice in a season. You know, at this point, what has Stephanie White done? Though, though she ha- I will say that she has recruited well. Uh, she's beaten Tennessee. Uh, wasn't it in Knoxville, Chris? If I remember correctly, not that that is what it used to be, but it is. It still happened on her watch, and it seems like she's starting to put some structure that there was she has effectively what I don't know Miss of course she just got that job technically um but as far as who stays the longest I you know I I would I would have to say Candace probably I, I don't know how Candace, to answer the, I don't either because I I don't know I this I mean it's almost as if those are three unfireable people. Yeah, they really it would are. Have to be a matter of it has to be a matter of them deciding to leave, and you know if you are at a situation where you can your job performance is kind of irrelevant, well then. But you're going to get a big fat stack of cheese, and how you do is irrelevant. That's that's so I don't know how to answer that. If you want to go on performance, Derek runs circles around the other two. Oh, I don't think there's any question. Now it's also the most. Well, I mean, the AD is the boss of everybody, right? So that's its own animal. I would say that if you had an underperforming football coach and an underperforming basketball coach, all things equal, you get rid of the football coach because that's the most important program there. So there's that, but. I don't know. I mean, I think what you said about all of them almost being unfireable is true. Now, I will tell you this. I think that Stephanie and Derek are a lot more thick-skinned than Candace, and I don't think it's close. I mean, Derek has got a survival instinct That and, and Stephanie kind of does too, although with Stephanie, nobody's watching, so how much pressure is there, right? Yeah. Um, I do wonder if the pressure would get to Candace one day and she'd just step down. I, I mean, I think that the problem with that is she's making, I think, about $800,000 a year. She's not going to make anything close to that somewhere else, so it's kind of like how much crap can you put up with and how much is it worth to you? Or, or would Vanderbilt just slide pressure her down? Pressure from who? Pressure from who? Have you seen Twitter lately? Man, come on, man. None of those people are in charge of, of whether or not she's going to be hired or fired. Yeah, you but know, I know clearly. for a fact she's taking this pretty hard. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, that's fine, too. You know, I mean, when you don't answer people's questions, when they ask you, when you tell them that there's a, that this is coming and that's coming, and when they ask you about it, you keep putting them off every time. You know, you you make blanket statements on on Twitter, and then when people respond to you, you have no answer for it, no response of any kind. I don't feel bad for that. Too bad. Welcome to being an athletic director in the Southeastern Conference. If if the pressures at Vanderbilt are too great for you because of Twitter, man, you can't work anywhere else in this country. You, I mean, you are in the cushiest of cushy. You're not even expected or even encouraged to win. So if this is too much, well, I mean, I would 
Vander, you know, get on people bagging on her and other people, stuff like that. Let me tell you something, man. This is the most mild. Uh, it, this is not pressure. This is nothing. It's nothing. This isn't a tenth of anything she'd get at the lowest other level SEC school. Not even close. Nothing. She doesn't have to answer. You think that you don't have to answer in Starkville ever at all, that you can just put people off and not answer anything? Think you can do that in Gainesville? Try to do that in Columbia, South Carolina. You know, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, College Station, Texas. See what happens there. You know, this this right here is the kiddie pool. Man, you can't handle this. You can't take a little social media, I mean, uh, ridicule here, deserved in many ways. What what are we talking about here? Yeah, oh, you, I'm not I'm arguing sorry, with me. You're just proving my point for me. That And that's the problem, right, is that I don't think she has any idea how to do her job, so I don't think that's going to get a lot better. I think that you've got football season coming. That's not going to be pretty if it happens at all. And I, but the, the issue, like I've said, the problem with Vanderbilt is getting rid of some of these people. They are paid so much. They're not going to get anything close to the opportunity they have. Um, you know, she's not going to get pressure from the university. She got hired in that job for a reason because that's what they wanted. Somebody that was not going to press the school on stuff. And so now the question becomes, well, is she just going to sit back and, uh, well, that's what you I'm know, saying. So where's the pressure coming from? Put up from the shutters and just, just yeah, hunker down and take it um, and say, hey, well, I'll yeah, cash my, my check. Point. and Right. I, I don't know. But but I'm saying you're already seeing signs already that she cannot handle what's in front of her. Even from as little pressure she gets from the school, what she's getting on the outside is ripping her apart. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, I don't like for anybody to go through tough times, but. You know, I mean, you know, you're a Vanderbilt, you're a Vanderbilt athlete. You know what that means to be one. You know, instead of having these people, these players and these these athletes walking around on eggshells, how about being their number one ambassador? You know, in every conceivable way, being out there vocal on the forefront, this is what I'm going to do for the people who send their children here, uh, who entrust us with their care and development, you know, and here's what we're going to do. Not there could be a plan one day and you'll hear what it is. It's going to be wonderful. It's fabulous. And every and, and then eight months later, when you haven't said a word and people are addressing it and you you you. you Turn the other cheek. I mean, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I don't feel for that. Why should I? Why would you? Well, the issue for her, like if she were running for office on platform, her platform would have been, I care for the student athletes and I'm good at getting stuff done for them, right? Okay. I, okay. Show me. Well, my point is that contingency, I think, is turning on her very quickly. You know. It can't be just about words. But now having said this, Chris, now I, I don't look, I don't dislike her as a person. I don't know her, so there's no reason for me to. But they need, those players need advocates, you know, at the highest level, you know. So Kirkland be damned, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, that's the job. That's what it is. And that's why I say, I mean, you know, if the if the worst thing she's getting is a little, you know, derogatory not derogatory but uh, uh, a negative tweet here and there well consider yourself extremely lucky you know you imagine pulling this crap in knoxville chris you saw what happened there they damn near rioted in the streets of knoxville and and that was based on trying to hire a guy who's you know, now, they, of course, you know what they'll say. We don't want that type of person. No, you didn't think he was good enough to be your coach. That's why you took to the streets. And you know that. You can lie about it, but you know it's true. Uh, now, just imagine here, you know, with, the, with those fan bases, if that fan base if they were dealing with what we deal with, they wouldn't have it. They wouldn't stand for it. 
We shouldn't either. Shouldn't either. Because what they count on, what that what Kirkland counts on is for you to belly ache for a second and to crawl back into your hole and be and behave and 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 not make a stink. That's what they count on. You know, and that's why, I mean, that's why I don't stop. That's why you're not stopping. You know, you're just reporting what's out there and what you see and what you know to be true. Uh, you know, and then, and that's why, like I said, when people who know that this is the case, know you're telling the truth and then try to, sl- I don't want to say slander you, but then try to pretend that this is an ax that you have to grind, which is hilarious at best, uh, I, you know, I mean that that more there needs to be more Chris Lees out there and more people re- saying this is unacceptable because the fact of the matter is we got student athletes around there walking on eggshells on a campus when they need the truth is they don't need you you need them way more than they need you. The problem she is way going more. to have. They have all the options in the world. The problem she's going to have and the problem Vanderbilt is going to have, Vanderbilt has counted on for a long time that nobody would speak out or that the truth was so crazy that if you reported it, you'd sound like a lunatic. And I will be honest, that probably kept me from saying and reporting some of the things I've done over the years. I knew that some things were crazy. It was like, nobody's going to believe this, right? I mean, how many conversations, and you can go back, people can go back and listen to our podcasts from the last couple of months where I've just said, hey man, how much stuff have I been sitting on that people don't know? Well, now they're starting to find out a little bit and they're starting to find out the pressure that I have been under, which was, if people are listening to this podcast and one on our board this week, uh, they missed the whole other side of the story there. I'm not going to get into it today, but that was the most, I don't know, that th- this week was the craziest week I've ever had at my own site in some ways. And either you read the thread on our board and you know exactly what I'm talking about or you didn't, and I'm not going to get into it here, but you know you've seen it. But here's well, what I'm what I, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, you you first. Well, I was gonna say I have read that thread and which I find pitiful at best, and I'm being polite about that, when it is well known that you know, you know who's lost here? Chris has. Ain't nobody lost more than Chris. Chris lost in this scenario. He was the number one loser. Why? Because he told the truth. Because he told the truth, and 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 what'd you do with it? Tried to make it look like he's the villain. Please, I'm not sitting. I'm not sitting there for. I don't have to. He ain't got nothing on me. And and I'm just tell you right now. I don't care where you sit. Chris is not the villain. He's the one who took a massive loss by by reporting what was out there. Massive loss because he told the truth. So you can try to paint him one way or the other, but you know the truth. You know dead gum well you know the truth. And to try to paint this person who has got more integrity than just about anybody I've ever worked with in this business and try to put this on him is beyond laughable. And I can't imagine somebody would do that, yet it happened anyway. The issue I think they are going to have is I think for a long time, and look, the stuff that I have reported on, on the board, in articles, on the podcast, that took me a long, 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 long time to get to. I mean, I'm not going to say some of the stories were 18 years in the making, but you have to learn the rocks to look under and the things underneath those rocks and the people to talk to once you uncover those. And then once you uncover a couple of rocks, you find out about this rock over here and that rock over there. Nobody could walk into my job. And I don't say this boastingly, right? This is not about me. I'm just saying it took me so long to figure out how things worked there and where to go to the truth that it has taken me almost two decades to get to this point. I don't think that Vanderbilt ever counted on anybody being able to do that. And I don't think that Vanderbilt counted on anybody, if they did it, to talk about it. 
and I don't think Vanderbilt counted on anybody. If anybody was willing to find it and talk about it, I think they just thought whoever did it, they could discredit and say this person's a kook or he doesn't know what he's talking about or whatever and make it so miserable on someone that they just walk away. And, man, you know they tried it with me. They did. Um, and it didn't work. I'm still here for how much longer, I don't know. But the the point is it's hard to get to that point. And then once you do, you figure out the enemy that you're looking at really is not that strong. And it is scared to death of what you were going to find. And I think that is what is about to make things really interesting with them because I think they think they can threaten people and smear reputations and do all the things that they have done for years to keep people in line. And I don't think they have any other game. I don't think they have a lot of cards that they're playing. Now, now maybe they will decide from this to do some stuff with football facilities and shut me up and make me look bad and make all the critics look bad. I doubt it. Could it happen? I mean, maybe. My point is, I don't think that anybody has ever put them in a corner like they've been put in now. And when you look up at your opponent and you look at how strong it is, once you have really stripped every one of those layers away, they're weak. And the problem for them now is people have figured that out. And if they think that by trying to discredit me or somebody else, that people are going to shut up or I'm not, or someone else is not going to have a story to run with or that people are going to quit talking to me or someone else, they're wrong because you know what's happened? In my last few months, I've had people in sources who have come out of the woodwork and have been bolder than they've ever been. And oh, by the way, that continues up until today. So, That's where I think they're going to have to figure some stuff out because I think if they figure they can keep playing the game they are playing and win, they're wrong. Well, and I'm glad we got folks like you that are willing to do that and go the extra mile. And, you know, hey, man, don't reach out and tell us that things are going to change if you don't mean it. And then when when they don't and they get questioned about it, then it's a problem. Hey, you're the one that said it. (laughs) <laughs> you should have won that said it, man. I, I mean, what do you what what do you expect to happen? What did you think was going to happen? People are only going to take so much, you know. And I'm ready for I, I'm ready to hold my head up high and 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 have these kids who choose Vanderbilt over everybody else have that pay off for them and let them know that the people there truly have their back and that they want them to excel and they succeed uh, at, at a level that is, that is unrivaled. And, and no matter what it takes, of course, within the letter of the law, uh, that they'll make that happen. And if they're not willing to do that, man, you know, then just tell them, just tell them, say, look, we're, we're, you know, we're full of it. We, we, we're, we're full of it, man. No, go somewhere else where, 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 where your, your, your education, according to that education, the, the college experience, was, which is made up of a whole lot of different things, can be cultivated and nurtured because we're not really willing to do that. You know, it's, it's not about me. I like winning. It's fun. It's cool. But do, but do what you promise for these folks. Wow. If you could see the, did you just see the throw down that John Morant had? Oh, I did Chris, not. Sorry. Not watching anything as we speak. Fox. Well, put it on Fox right now. The Grizz were 15 down, they're up by three now, and John Morant just flushed one down on an alley oop over a dude, about, about six, 10 dudes. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Get them, Grizz. Sorry about that. That's all right. I think we've kind of hit the point where we said about all we can say in the show today. So unless you've got something else, let's uh, tell people where they can find your shows, where they can find you on Twitter, and wrap this sucker up. You can find me on Twitter, at Cheap Seats Bass. Uh, and, and things are going well. You know, I've had people ask about the station switch and all that. And, you know, we're still in the middle of the transition to doing all that. But it is – here's what I'll tell you. I'm pretty excited. I'm very excited about uh, what 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 I'm seeing and what I'm hearing and and some of the opportunities here. Uh, I, I think it's going to be even better, and I'm awfully excited about that. So uh, I just want to say thank you for the people that asked and reached out about that. Uh, that it is going quite well. 
And you can find me on your dial 6 o'clock p.m. Monday through Friday on 101.5. Thank you as always. You're welcome, man. He's Seabass. I'm Chris Lee. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast. More than likely, we will have an episode next week. We might take a break as we wait for more news to develop with football. Uh, and, and frankly, I've got a breath to catch or two and some stuff to take care of on the personal end. So uh, if we don't have a show next week, we should be back with more. But I plan to do one. Thank you for listening to us. Have a great weekend, and we will catch you again very soon.